tonight on DXB Today, we've been having one interesting conversation after another about the innovations in education. And of course, we'll be joined by the principal of Arbor School, Brett Gerben. Thanks for joining us tonight, Brett. Now, I know that Arbor School is completely different. It's a green school. Explain, please, how is this? Thank you very much. Um, I mean, there's, there's lots of elements that we share with many of the other schools because our what essentially is the same as any other national curriculum school, the British curriculum school, the standards, the expectations, reading, writing, arithmetic, if you like. Those are not optional in my school, but we take a very forward stance towards sustainability. Um, and, and we're a really purpose-driven school where the idea is to help children not only make those operational decisions of switching off the lights and reducing their footprint, but also a deeper mindset change over long periods of time so that those, you know, those decisions about how to make a more abundant world possible are really built into who they are. I know that they have a biodome in uh -huh. school. This one really interested me because I do not have a green thumb, but uh -huh. I think everybody at an early age should learn a little bit about this. And, and do you impose this on your children that they need to learn about planting and greenery and things like that? Um, yes, I, I guess in a difficult environment like Dubai, if you want children to connect with nature, you have to get them into nature. So the biodomes are a way to take a slice of nature and encapsulate it inside so that children can then get out into nature when maybe the weather's not so great as it is today. So trying to be really place-based and, and help children understand that nature's not over there, it's a part of who we are, we're connected to nature. And once we connect to nature, then we can start to decide how we're going to look after nature. So the biodomes are really just a way to bring that indoors in a difficult environment. So t tell me more about how are you implementing this then? Because we throw these words around mm -hmm. all the time, sustainability and recycle, and how are you, what are you actually doing? Come on. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, isn't it funny how we're still using recycling as something we do? Yeah. How is that not a default position? Yeah, great. Right? But if we're still having to teach that to children, then clearly we're not getting an implicit, a deeper mindset change. We're just teaching it as a thing. We're doing sustainability, and they might do it at school and come home and they stop doing it again. So the operational on-off switches of saving water and switching off lights is actually the easiest fix. The harder part is the deep mindset change. So what does that look like in curriculum? You, you connect children to nature, you get them out in nature. Nice. Then you connect their learning together through your, your ways of teaching, the places you teach, the content you teach. And then as you layer it up through the school, so when we get to our, our big kids, if you like, our, our secondary school, is you start to look at the complexity of passion and purpose. How do they bring their passion and purpose and go into the world to change or to solve big problems by connecting the dots, understanding that we're all connected. You and I aren't competitors, we're collaborators, and we have to make life-affirming decisions to try and solve these problems and think in systems. Mm -hmm. Thinking practically about how I and many other teachers around the UAE can bring sustainability into the curriculum to impact the children, what would you advise to try and support us as teachers who perhaps don't have facilities such as biodomes? Yep. Um, we see sustainability as a something that's difficult, but if I said to you, let's work on literacy, you'd say, right, we need to apply people to it, we need to apply resources to it, we need to make sure that's high on our agenda. Mm. So do all the same things with sustainability. We need to make sure our children learn about it. We need to apply resources to it. We're going to have to put some time and effort into it. And if you put that into it, your teachers who are endlessly creative will come up for ways to bring that into any environment. But biodome is just a thing, right? We could have built a pirate ship. Uh, it's <laughs> how you use the thing that now becomes that's important. that's cool, that's, right? <laughs> Partnership would probably be great. So, yeah, Year of Sustainability, Sustainability, COP28, boxes are being ticked left, right and centre by industries and companies the world over, and none more so than here. Schools and getting kids engaged in sustainability as well. I mean, I go back to what Thomas is trying to do by trying to engage on TikTok and social media. Is that a tool that you could implement to try and infuse children a little more, better understanding? Absolutely. I mean, children, children will come home from our school overnight change in eco worries really quickly but no one wants you know we're not trying to say well let's all just be miserable and accept less and less and less to make our world sustainable we want more we want a more abundant world full of connection and kindness and happiness and joy and the way to an abundant world is to just accept the slight a measure of sufficiency so how can we encourage children to be excited about those things i mean nature itself is eminently excitable right they, they just dive into it so any chance you can give children to be outside in nature with nature talking about nature it is fantastic and and it's not that um being you know to be eco-literate you've got to be literate yeah. so these things aren't juxtaposed i'm not yeah. saying you can have good english or good eco-literacy these two things go hand in hand yeah. it's a fabulous opportunity here's a good question for the parents who are watching right now because my kids learn about recycling and all these things in school as well but for some reason the moment they reach the house it's out the window 
and I have to be like, hey, they didn't throw you know the rubbish out of the window? <laughs> <laughs> That's outrageous. Probably not. <laughs> yeah. They need to go to Arva School. How would you get them to continue whatever they learn in the school outside? Uh, it would be bad news if I said, well, actually, the values that they learn in school need to continue outside of the school. So I w I'm, I'm sure that you're fantastic at encouraging those same <laughs> Thank things. Thank you. Um, so, but that is a real challenge because, like I said, it's an on-off switch. If they're doing it in school and not seeing the same values out school, it's not being modelled outside of the school, then it becomes, a, a, you know, difficult for them to visualise. So how would you continue? Just, I mean, it's all about positive praise. You know, no one wants to be in a miserable sort of environment where everything's bad. We really just have to encourage them with all the positive things. This can be a fabulous, beautiful, biodiverse, abundant, connected world if we see it that way. Or we can see it as a miserable opportunity to just accept less and less and less. I love it. It's a perfect way of looking at it. Brett, thank you so much for coming on. It's been really, really fascinating and I wish you all the best of luck with Arbor School. Right, our spotlight today is on a startup that's helping students look for scholarships to support them in their university education. We caught up with the founder of Secure My Scholarship, Craig Fernandez. Hi, my name is Craig Fernandez. I'm the co founder and CEO of Secure My Scholarship. Secure My Scholarship is an edtech platform that connects students with scholarships and fee waivers at universities in Dubai and around the world. According to research, for every one student that goes to a quality university somewhere around the world, there are four students that cannot. That means that for the five million students that went overseas last year, there are 20 million students who are denied that opportunity simply because they cannot afford it. We want to solve this problem. We want to make sure that these 20 million students are able to study at the universities that they want to study at, not the universities that they can simply afford. We want to help make their dreams come true and help them enroll at the universities of their dreams. So we set up Secure My Scholarship in 2021 to connect students with scholarships at universities around the world. Um, while we've done a lot of amazing things in the last two years, you know, we've scaled the team from five people to 30 people. We've scaled revenues from zero to $1.5 million this year. I think our biggest accomplishment at Secure My Scholarship is dispersing, as of the end of August, dispersing over $6.5 million in scholarships to students from middle class and working class families. I think the biggest hurdle that we've had to overcome is convincing people to take, to trust us and believe in us. The higher education industry is a notoriously difficult industry to crack open. Most of the people in this industry have been around, have been in the industry for five years, 10 years, 15 years, 20 years. And here, this upstart startup from Dubai that nobody's ever heard of comes and tries to disrupt how they do things. Um, that took a lot of time and convincing to break our way in. So we set up Secure My Scholarship because we wanted to change the world. Our North Star with Secure My Scholarship is to disperse $100 million in scholarships to students from lower, from lower class, middle class, working class families around the world and help change their lives. We want to build a platform that can bring about a fundamental change in the lives of hundreds of thousands of students and millions of people when you think about the mothers, the fathers, the grandfathers, the grandmothers around the world and build Asia's next great edtech unicorn along the way. I love Dubai. I was born over here, raised over here, went to school over here, and we launched Secure My Scholarship in Dubai. My passport may say I'm Indian, but I am from Dubai. I love what the city has to offer, um, from the diversity and the ease of doing business, the opportunities available in this city are unparalleled. And I'm actually so grateful that I'm able to call Dubai my home and we were able to launch Secure My Scholarship in Dubai. To me, Dubai represents opportunity. My parents moved here in the early 90s from India looking for work, as did so many immigrants at that time. I was born in Dubai in 1996 and I grew up in a small apartment on the outskirts of Dubai that cost 6,000 dirhams a year in rent. I lived there until 2010. And from a, for a boy who grew up in a small, tiny apartment that cost 6,000 dirhams a year, 
to today running an ed tech startup valued at $6 million. That is an opportunity that only Dubai can offer. I love the diversity on offer here in Dubai. On a daily basis, you will meet an Indian, you will meet a Pakistani, you will buy your groceries from a Bangladeshi, you will get into a cab with a Nigerian, uh, you will get your hair cut by a Lebanese man. It is amazing. The plethora of nationalities and cultures available in this city is unparalleled, and I love that about Dubai. Um, if I had an entire day to recharge, probably head over to Mamzar. If I want something indoors, probably, probably Dubai Mall, honestly. Um, I love Dubai Mall, it's huge. Absolutely love what Craig was saying. He can come back. He said all the right things to Craig there. <laughs> Grew up here. He nurtured his business here. And as he was saying, uh, pretty much couldn't have done it without being in Dubai. Also founded Lock and Stock. No, no, no. Not the one with the live entertainment, the really good brunch, <laughs> all right? Uh, the other one, the mobile app that rewards students every time uh, they spend time away from their phones. And I wanted to get your thoughts on mm. that because we got the TikTok teacher Thomas here with us <laughs> in studio. And sort of smartphones, pretty essential to content creation these days and the consumption of. And yet, that fine line between smartphones yes, in true. the classroom. Yeah, it can absolutely be a distraction too. I think it's about finding the tools which children can access in a constructive manner. So whether or not it's children using laptops rather than just being on their phones. I think that's more of a positive, constructive way for children to then be able to be creative, but without being distracted. But you're not one for, uh, and I should have asked the principal this earlier, but you're not one for banning smartphones in schools. Do they, do, they, do they have a role at school? I think, again, it comes back to how they're being used. Right. If children are using them for social media, actually communicating with one another during class time, then of course that's a distraction. Mm. But if it's using that as a creative way to be constructive and to learn from using those devices, then it's a benefit. Yeah. You for or against, Katie? Oh, listen, I, I would like to be rewarded for putting my phone away <laughs> because I'm not very good <laughs> at that whatsoever. Anyway. Only, especially during mealtime, okay? Yes, oh, I never have All my right. phone at mealtime. Oh, really? Uh, right, we are uh, more focused on education coming your way, the changing face of education. In fact, a lot more to look forward to throughout the uh, evening. Let's see what is coming up, Katie. Yeah, absolutely. We're going to be chatting with Raya Bashari about the School of Humanity, a breakthrough online school reinventing education. And don't forget, we still have Katie's exclusive interview with Adam Gilchrist. So stay tuned. We'll be right back. <laughs> 